A few years ago, me and a friend were getting pretty sick of the New England weather. We get our fair share of sunshine up here, but only for about three weeks out of 52. So after one particularly washout summer where the sky barely shifted from its regular gray tone, we decided on a road trip to alleviate the rain-soaked misery. We didn't have a destination in mind as such just a direction south as far south as we could possibly go without having to buy ourselves a Spanish phrase book. About a fortnight in we'd made it all the way down to New Mexico. I had enjoyed the barbecue in South Carolina, relished the peach cobbler in Georgia, but nothing compared to the food in New Mexico. I thought I'd be eating good Mexican food back home, but I came to realize I'd been eating lies. Turns out the closer you get to the border, the better the food gets. Mexican food isn't all about spice either, although that is a big part of it. But even then, it's not that bear mace kind of burning hot that we might associate with it. There's tangy, fruity salsa made from pineapples, not to mention the smoky flavor that on show chili imparts, the dishes. But I digress. We've been so charmed by New Mexico that instead of rolling through it into Arizona like we planned, we decided to tour a little more the state before leaving. This meant we rolled down dusty roads, visiting little cowboy towns and the hito joints along the way. So at one point, we're still a few 100 miles away from our planned stop and we're getting pretty tired. Driving at night can be disorienting and dangerous. So instead of just switching over while the driver sleeps in the back seat, we decide to just pull over and sleep a few hours until dawn before we get back on the road. The only problem was finding somewhere safe enough to park up. Now when I picture New Mexico, I picture the kinds of adobe brown desert scenes made famous by old westerns. But as it turns out, New Mexico has its fair share of snow-capped mountains and lush green forests. We happen to be driving by one such patch of tall pines when we called our rest up, so we pull in and turn down a dirt road and wind it among the trees. We're taking it slow trying to find a turn-off for campground to park up at to get some shut-eye. It took a while, but we found one parking up and turning off the engine before unpacking our sleeping gear and leaning back the seats. As you can imagine, though, New Mexico gets real warm and stays real warm well into the night. So although it did leave us prey to the mosquitoes, cracking the window to allow some much-needed fresh air and was absolutely essential. It was actually kind of nice for a while lying there drifting off with the sound of crickets chirping and coyote zipping in the hills. It was relaxing, listening to the sounds of nature, until I heard a sound that was distinctly unrelaxing. The sound of hushed human voices. My eyes opened to the darkness as I strained to hear just what these voices are saying. But I can't make out anything specific. Just that at least two people are talking amongst themselves in hushed tones. This is a big red flag for me. Sometimes you get people walking past your car when you're trying to sleep, mostly in cities, but sometimes out in the sticks too. If they're loud, it generally means they're just drunk and headed home. Sure, drunk can be another kind of red flag for danger, but not nearly as much as actual hushed voices. Whispers mean a person doesn't want to be heard. Whispers mean someone is up to no good. Although we're from a state where legislation is made firearm ownership pretty much next to impossible. We weren't about to roll down the deep south without proper protection. Not so much from the people. All our interactions with people in the southern states were overwhelmingly positive. But there's no reasoning with a bear or a rattlesnake. So we stopped at the first gun show we found in West Virginia to pick up something small but powerful. A 44 snub nose revolver. The moment I heard those hushed whispering voices, I popped the glove compartment and took it out. After I made sure it was loaded, I leaned over to my buddy and gently shook him awake. Ah. What time as his eyes were bloodshot. His voice croaky. Listen to me. The fear in my voice had him paying attention. There's someone outside, we talked it over countless times what we do if someone tried to rob or kidnap us what was at first a morbid mental exercise had suddenly become all too real. We decided to get out and confront whoever was out there, hoping they'd hear that we are armed, get scared, and take off. 
It could have just been a few kids hanging around drinking, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. So we get out me with a flashlight in one hand, the revolver, and the other. We're both shining flashlights into the trees, but seeing nothing. We haven't heard any voices since we got out of the car, and I'm hoping they've just moved on. But like I said, better safe than sorry. Hey, anyone there? My buddy calls out into the darkness. We give a minute or so, and no one replies. But that doesn't mean we're feeling safe and sound. So we started walking into the trees, trying to find whoever was whispering. I'm expecting to find a handful of thugs who were going to rob us of our car and wallets. But what we found was much, much worse. The thing that hit me first was the smell. The further we got into the trees, the stronger the sickly sweet smell of hot garbage seemed to be. Neither of us had ever smelled anything like it in our lives. So it wasn't like we had anything to compare it to. It wasn't like we recognized that there anything. Then we saw the pit, the shadow of the ground opening up before us. Then we saw the shovels. The plastic sheets stained with something brownish-red flies were buzzing around the open pit so loud I could barely hear my own voice when I exclaimed in pure horror at what lay at the bottom. It was a body a human body. Only it was barely recognizable as one. It had been beaten so badly. It looked like a monster, a hideous imitation of the human form. The face was swollen, bloodied and bruised, eyelids swollen shut as huge busted lips still beat gore onto the neck and chin. We ran, got into our car, and got out of there. What followed was probably the most terrifying few minutes of my life. I expected to see another vehicle's lights appear on the road behind us getting bigger as they got closer, chasing us down to silence us forever. But they didn't. Nothing happened. And the adrenaline had us so wired that we drove all night to the next town, calling into the local sheriff's department as soon as we arrived. We didn't stay long in that area. So naturally, we didn't hear back from the cops regarding what happened to the body. Or if they found the guys trying to bury it. What I still think about it's every now and then, and what that poor person could have possibly done to deserve to die in such a way. Me and my friends are grunge freaks. We started out on Nirvana and Soundgarden, eventually discovering more obscure bands like Mud Honey, The Melvins, and The Screaming Trees. Anyone who knows anything about grunge will tell you that it all started in Seattle, how the spontaneous new genre sprang out of the ashes of post-punk to take the world by storm. And it all happened within like a few square miles. So naturally, Seattle is like a mecca for grunge fans. And after years of planning and false commitment, we finally got our stuff together and went on a road trip to our sacred city. That's how we ended up on the Wyoming interstate. So we're just driving along singing along to Allison Chain's songs when the next thing I know, I can see red and blue flashes in my rear view. My buddies in the back seat spin around seeing the same thing I did an unmarked vehicle with one of those attachable emergency lights on the top. As I start to pull over, I'm wondering where this cop car came from. We were on this long stretch of open road and could see for miles around us. It was pretty unnerving that it had managed to just creep up on us like that. But you know how it is traffic cops tend to stay out of sight and little rest areas or whatever their speedometer is at the ready. Now I was well within the speed limit, but I was still worried. I'd be lying if I said we didn't have anything on us that we shouldn't have but that was all buried in our bags in the trunk. And even then it wasn't exactly enough to charge us with. So I just got my driver's license ready on my lap and kept my hands at 10 and 2, like a good little city. Isn't the cop turns off his lights and then gets out of the unmarked car walking along the dusty road towards us. He's wearing civilian clothes, a baseball cap, aviator sunglasses, and checkered shirt but I can clearly see the utility belt and badge he's wearing. When he knocks my window, I promptly roll it down, smiling, while I give him my cheeriness. Good afternoon, officer. I'm no bootlicker. But I'm not going to give this guy an excuse to ruin our road trip. What follows probably isn't exactly what was said that day. But it says best as I can remember. 
Afternoon officer, how can I help you? Driver's license and registration. He demands curtly sure thing. I take one hand off the steering wheel and handed my license. He takes a long careful look first at my license, then at me the Troy, hmm, hey, finally said dismissively. You're a long way from home, son. Was your business in Wyoming? We're actually on a road trip, sir. Headed out towards Washington, Seattle to be specific Wolfer, just because, I guess always wanted to see the West Coast. Just because the cop mockingly interjected, maybe see some of California. My words broke off. I really didn't like where the whole thing was going. Any weapons in the car? No, sir. Drugs or alcohol? No, sir, I replied without hesitation. But the answer didn't satisfy him. I could feel his steely gaze from behind his mirrored sunglasses. They made him seem like more of a machine than a man. I'm gonna need y'all to step out of the vehicle. His voice was cold. What? What for? Don't make me tell you again, son. I turned to my buddies in the back seat. They looked his word as I felt. Slowly. We did as we were told and got out of my car, walking over to the side of the road and grouping together near the verge. It was then that I actually got a good look at the unmarked car the cop was driving. It was an old Dodge pickup. I mean really old. It looked like it might fall apart if the thing drove faster than 40-something interesting you about my vehicle son? No, sir. I lied. Thinking that the department must have been seriously underfunded. The knots front one of my buddies shot me a look as if to say, what is this guy's deal? With I just shook my head. Figuring if we just played along, we get out of there faster. I'm going to need to see the passengers' IDs. The cop said suddenly. Mine's in the car. My one friend said the other said the same. You didn't take out IDs to show a cop at a traffic stop. Are you mentally disabled? I know the go get them. Pair you cue more nervous looks amongst us before they start wandering back to the car to get their IDs. Then, to my complete shock. The cop takes his revolver out of his holster, hip flicks off the safety, and points it towards my buddies. One of my friends turns look down the barrel of the revolver and freezes in place. Pure fear in his eyes. I'm not going to shoot you what I need to cover myself, just in case you pull a pistol out of that back seat. The cop said with a grin. Gone. Go get him. It was about this point that I decided to make a formal complaint against the cop. I was scared, sure. But I was also really angry to whatever backwater county this was their volunteer sheriff program obviously needed some thorough vetting. I didn't know how much good to do, but I had to do something the city had had to pay. After he gets my buddy's ID, he takes them back to his truck and starts writing stuff down on a notepad obviously all our personal information. Then he starts talking to someone, but not on a radio as you'd expect. All he had was a cell phone in his hand. When he finishes he gets out, then doesn't even walk all the way over to us, before just tossing our ideas in the dirt. Gone. Get out of Wyoming, he's bad, before getting back into his truck and speeding off into the distance, leaving us choking on a cloud of dirt. Once he's out of sight, we start cursing going out raging about how we're going to make a formal complaint once we're back home from our trip now. Cut to about an hour later, and we're only about 50 miles further into our journey. When another set of red and blue lights appear in my rear view, we just straight up panic at this point and actually debate whether or not to try it outrun this psycho, since there's no way his old truck keep up. But once we work out that it's an actual marked unit this time, and evidently not some idiot, we pull over and repeat the entire process. Only. It doesn't go quite the same way. I'll just tell you what you need to know. At some point, I mentioned to this uniform cop that I've already been stopped like just an hour before. He looks confused and asked where we've been pulled over. I didn't know any place names by heart, but I insisted it was less than 100 miles back the way we came when the uniform cop tells us that that's impossible. 
It takes all my will not to ask the guy if all Wyoming cops are as incompetent as this. But then he finishes his sentence. I'm the only highway patrol in the county right now. If it wasn't me who pulled you over? I really don't know who did. We described the guy who pulled us over to the uniformed cop told him the vehicle type, even the color of this idiot's mustache. But the cop has no clue who we were talking about. Then it hits us. The guy wasn't highway patrol. He wasn't even a volunteer deputy. To this day, we have no idea who it was that pulled us over on that stretch of interstate. Our complaints to the state police went nowhere. As far as I know, they never found the guy to charge him with impersonating an officer. The lesson being even though it might make them mad, always ask for ID from cops who pull you over. And be sure to take a darn good look at it. There's some real psychos out there. Many years ago now my family and I were on a road trip going to visit Big Bend National Park down in Texas. This was way before the World Wide Web mind you. That's important for you to know, and you'll know why in a moment. We were trying to plan where to stay having picked up several brochures for actual ranch stays in the area at the time. There were only about three or four to begin with. We narrowed them down to two, which appeared to list the very same things, horseback riding. It's important to note here that when we made reservations, we verified that the horses would be available during our visit when we called swimming rooms with air conditioning, etc. We wanted to horseback riding and there were only about two that actually offered it. One was $10 cheaper than the other one. The cheaper one we assumed was cheaper because it was further out in the country than the other one, which was right in the middle of town. We kind of liked the idea of the quiet desert. Neither brochure had any pictures. So we can only guess about this. Oh my, how we wish we had seen pictures. But first, you know how we selected it because it was further out of town. We had to take a coarsely graveled road to get to the ranch. And the road was about 18 miles long and we got an actual flat and not just any flat. We blew a huge hole in the tire. Sure, we had a spare. But the point is, is that we're in the middle of the Texas desert with very little water and it's fast approaching midday. It's actually really dangerous to be out there since you can develop heat stroke literally within about 20 minutes of being exposed to that kind of heat. And the size of the hole in the tire meant that a patch was impossible. We also didn't know any numbers for local mechanics. So we're kind of panicking when this other truck comes rolling along. He eyes us up and down seeing that we're city folk and you can tell straight away he is nothing but contempt for us. He starts telling us all about how dangerous it is to be stuck out here in the desert. How quickly rattlesnake venom can kill you dead. How the vultures pick clean the bones of anything that falls victim to the elements out there. That's if the bandits or smugglers didn't find his first. The local guy sold us a new tire for are you ready for this? $150, yep, keep in mind that this was about 25 years ago. So imagine how much that would be now. And it wasn't like we couldn't not buy it. We had no choice. It was literally buy the tire, or face the consequences. So we paid for the tire, and went on our way. When we arrived, we gaped in horror at the scene before us. The place we chose this cheaper one wasn't a hotel ranch at all. They were actually trailers sitting on a rocky hill. I kid you not. I'm talking mobile homes lifted and sitting on tons of rocks on hills. Sure, and they were weighted down and there was a great edge. But you had to actually climb the rocks to get to the trailer cabin rocks, and you had to carefully ascend them. How a place like this ever got a business license, nor have a lawsuit filed against them is beyond me. I guess in those days, I suppose people weren't as so happy as they are now, though. I do remember it was getting started. Good. But I digress. When we checked in, in the dining room, we were informed that the horses were not out for the summer yet. And this was in May, and South Texas, where it's summer nearly all year round. This after we had been told that they would definitely be available on that date. Fine. We ate our dinner in the dining room, 
which was at the bottom of the rock hill went to make our way up the hill to the trailer, and my foot slipped on a rock. And the next thing I knew I was falling off the rocks. My ankle was sprained. Now how in the heck, I was supposed to finish climbing up there to get to the room. For that matter, how would I ever go back and forth? So we finally get to the room and I elevate my foot on the bed. I'm hot. I'm tired. And I just want to sit for a few minutes, thanking God that at least this bad day is nearly over. I turn on the TV hoping to find something relaxing to watch. We were told that the Kevins had satellite TV, which was just getting started good. Unfortunately, we could only pick one channel. Was it any surprise, then, that the one channel we got was only in Japanese? Are you kidding me? This is the Texas desert. I could see Spanish, but Japanese. I showed my teenage son, but he said it wasn't Japanese text. It was a language he'd never seen before, and he's really into Asian cartoons and whatnot. The shower was completely broken. They'd only drizzle water, and that water was scorching hot. Not useful at all. We weren't able to take a shower while we were there. And believe me we needed to. Later, we joked about it saying that we felt like we were in Chevy Chase's National Lampoon's vacation movie when nothing goes right. It's funny now though, obviously it wasn't back then, is those kinds of trips that create truly vivid memories. But the first night we hardly slept. There were weird noises of things moving outside the mobile homes, things sniffing and scratching in the dirt outside. It was horrible. We toured ourselves, it was just coyotes, but I know coyotes, and they don't make those noises. The next morning, my husband took a walk in the fields around us. When he got back, he told us to pack her bags. The horses weren't missing at all. They were all in a field about a mile out from our mobile homes, all laying in a field flies buzzing around with their corpses lay. As we left for the Big Bend area, we decided to stop in at the other ranch we had considered. It was nauseating to discover that that place was perfect. The bedrooms were authentic looking. The beds were old Texas style beds, the kind that are a large box with a mattress on it. The horses were out front, the TV worked in that HBO, they had an amazing shower room and the dining room had ceiling fans. Oh my what a mistake we had made. It would only have been an extra $10. Needless to say, the lesson we learned was to never ever book a stay anywhere without first seeing pictures. That seems like dad advice for today. But back then there wasn't much we could do about it. In any case, it was definitely an adventure. A few years back my friends and I decided to see the country. We'd grown up around Sacramento area and as much as we love their native Cali, we knew well that the Lower West Coast is hardly a decent representation of the United States. Apparently, there's a huge stretch of land between the coasts called America, or at least that's what some would have you believe. But either way, I didn't want to go off to college and into full-time work without having a story or two to tell my dorm mates. So cut to about three days into the journey. We're on our way to our first real stop in Boise, Idaho. My buddies hooked his iPhone up to the minivan speakers by an auxiliary cable and is in the process of playing every single road trip related song he could possibly find. I might have been annoyed if his music tastes wasn't so good. Keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel. We all rode along with Jim Morrison, Roadhouse, blues blasting so loud, I could barely hear the van's engine. It was so much fun. We dreamed up the ultimate road trip and now we were actually living it didn't even need a beer to feel the buzz of it. Just a few miles outside of Boise, we see someone standing by the side of the road in the distance. It's important to remember the frame of mind, we're in romanticizing the road. We were all Jack Kerouac that day. I mean, I've never normally stopped for a hitchhiker. I've always watched way too many horror films. But since there was four of us packed into that van, a kind of collective bravado had taken over us. So as we pass the dude and see he actually has his thumb out, we collectively flip. I stop the van in the middle of the road and slowly start reversing up towards where this guy stood. In a ride, dude. 
He instantly looked elated. He'd obviously had no luck for a few good hours, and a van full of teenagers was like a godsend to him. I could kind of see why people might pass him. He looked a little rough with this weird kind of young old vibe going on. Like his clothes were fairly modern, but his skin was leathery as all get out. Like he'd spent all day underneath Utah or Nevada sun. I'll go on the Boise, he asks in the gravelly voice. Sure. Our dude hop in. So the guy tells us his name is Jimmy. And then he's actually from Idaho originally, but has spent a lot of time out of state for work. We asked him what he does for a living, and he gave us some weird answer about being a contractor said his last job was really constrictive. And he was really happy to get away from it. And I was just heading back into Boise to see some old friends. He starts telling us stories from time to time on the road, and it sounded like he was something of a wild child in the early 80s. How he went to California looking for work and ended up getting in a few scrapes with the law, at one point one of my buddies asked Jimmy if he'd spent any time inside. I really don't know what he expected the answer to be, but all of a sudden, Jimmy's tone changes completely as he shoots my friend a dagger. Look. No, I don't ever intend to. He replied contemptuously. The atmosphere in the van shifted. It was super awkward for a few miles. But the conversation soon returned to normal with us swapping stories and sharing laughs. After about an hour or so of continuous driving, we were getting closer and closer to Boise. But it was around then that we hit our first serious speed bump. I look in the rearview mirror and see an Idaho State Police cruiser. As it's speeding up behind us, I move over a little to let it pass. Only it doesn't. Then Jimmy saw the cop car and ducks down in the seat. We started laughing and joking about him being a fugitive or something. Only he doesn't join in. He just stays down in the seat and doesn't make a sound. As soon as the cop car's lights turn on and the siren blared across the highway, I knew what was about to happen. It was like I could see the whole thing pan out in my head in slow motion. And I was powerless to do anything to stop it. It was far too late for that. Actually start slowing down pull over purely wishful thinking on my part. I expected to hear Jimmy say something and I was right. Only it wasn't him that spoke first. What? You have a gun. One of my buddies cries. You keep this thing moving. Don't stop for nothing. I hear him cock the hammer on his weapon. I didn't even turn around to see what it was. You slow this van down and I'm gonna shoot every single one of you here. And we've been so scared in my entire life. I could hear the cop shouting over his loudspeaker driver pull the vehicle over to the side of the road right now. But I couldn't. We were trapped. It was only about them that I checked the fuel gauge out of habit. It turned out to be a godsend. In our foolish revelry, we passed numerous gas stations, we really should have stopped that to refuel. Now we only had a few miles worth of gas. All we'd have to do is wait for it to run out. I remember feigning a kind of solidarity with the guy, assuring him I wouldn't pull over until we passed state lines on the other side of Boise. My buddies must have thought I was nuts. But they didn't know what I did. They didn't know that all we had to do was run the clock out. Oh, we're running out of gas. Sorry, dude, I'm gonna have to pull over your best chances to just jump out and run. Just running never looked back. Jimmy ate it up. It was an Oscar-winning performance if I do say so myself. He actually pat me on the shoulder as I slowed the van down and edge over to the roadside. You're a good kid. You'll do all right. He said. I remember his breath smelling rotten. When I finally pulled the car over one of my buddies slides the van door open and Jimmy hauls it into the trees. One of the cops jumps out securing us in the van while his partner got this big dog from the backseat of their cruiser and chased the guy through the woods. We were there for an hour or two while the cops searched our van. But we didn't have anything illegal on us. Thank God, we finished all the beer we've managed to wrangle the night before. 
or we might have actually had something to worry about. Once it was established that the guy was basically holding us hostage, they let us go. And one of the cops actually tells me I did the right thing. They didn't catch him and as far as I know, they never have. But whatever the case, I know Jimmy can have been the dude's real name. No one was hurt, nothing was damaged. But still, I have zero intention of ever picking up a hitchhiker again.